on this edition of It's a Miracle. A candle left burning ignites a fire in a two-story home in Nuevo, California. Upstairs, a mother and her three children are trapped in the inferno. I saw her go to the door and open it, and then like shut it because she got burnt. As flames grow stronger, all hope of escape seems to fade, until their nightmare is interrupted by a dream. Josh, Josh, Josh you gotta get up. up. Plus, do you believe that some people are fated to meet? Hey. Hi. That they're destined to find one another? Avi, you're... Avi, Sharon. Sharon, yeah. We started talking, and it was like I always knew her. We just connected on so many different levels. But neither of them knew just how special their relationship was, nor the incredible way their lives were connected. And later... A young man suddenly becomes seriously ill. Hey, 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 Robbie, you all right? He had a, a terrible night breathing. He told me that he, he did not feel very well at all and that uh, he thought that there was something seriously wrong with him. Hours later, his parents learn that their son is dying of liver and heart failure. It's a story of a medical miracle, and it's not the doctors who perform it. Find out what happened on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show has something for everyone. Mystery, adventure, romance, even a cute little dog. But as different as these stories are, they all have one thing in common, a miracle. Our first story takes us into dangerous territory, the raging inferno of a house on fire. It's a terrifying, life-threatening situation. And as you're about to see, one young boy might not be alive today if it weren't for the miraculous intervention of another person, a man who's been dead for over 14 years. On April 8, 1999, 16-year-old Joshua Greco arrived home late from a party with friends. It was spring break, and I got home about 10, 30, 11. My little sister was asleep on the couch. Jennifer. So I woke her up. Wake up. Go ahead and sleep in mom's room, OK? And I shut off all the lights and just went upstairs and crashed, basically. Neither Joshua nor his sister Jennifer realized that they had left a candle burning in the living room. And several hours later, it started a fire downstairs that would quickly spread up the stairwell to where they were sleeping. The first thing I remember is I heard my mom. She was just in panic. Jennifer, get up. The house is on fire. Call 911. Go up. I got up Call out of her eight. bed. Call I picked up the phone. I went into her bathroom because I couldn't see. And I was so nervous, I couldn't dial 911. My mom just grabbed the phone from me. She dialed it. My house is on fire. It is 1508 South Oak Drive. Margaret attempted to reach her other children, but the corridor was already engulfed in flames. I saw her go to the door and open it, and then like shut it because she got burnt. Her younger son, Corey, heard his mother's screams. But when he opened his door, the heat was so intense that it burned his entire back as he turned to run. All he was able to do was to crawl back to his bed. Meanwhile, Margaret and Jennifer managed to climb to the ground from a balcony outside the master bedroom. And I just coughed out all this smoke. I didn't know what to do. I was just so freaked out. Corey was trapped inside his room, and the only person that could reach him was his brother Joshua. But Joshua was asleep, and with every breath, he was inhaling more and more deadly smoke from the fire burning outside his door. Only a miracle could wake him now. The conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues.
a candle left unattended, and moments later a fire sweeps through a two-story family home in Nuevo, California. Upstairs, a mother and her three children are trapped as flames engulf the corridors. Her nine-year-old son is huddled inside his room after being severely burned trying to escape. His older brother lies sleeping only doors away, but nothing, not the screams of his mother and sister outside the house, nor the roar of the raging inferno can wake him. But Joshua Greco is about to experience a miracle. A guardian angel has come to help him. Next thing that I can remember is my father coming to me in a dream. I was in deep sleep and all of a sudden I just see his face. And he says, Josh, Josh, Josh you got to get, get up. up. You got to get, get up, up, buddy. I hadn't had any dreams of that before. So I woke up, and I was still disoriented. And I opened the door, and the flame just gushed. And I just turned around and jumped out my window. He jumped the 20 feet to the ground without being injured. His mother's voice led him to the back of the house. And she was screaming, Corey's still inside the house. Oh my God, just get Corey. So I ran around to the front of the house and I climbed up onto the roof. I just went up to the window, knocked on the window, see if he'd respond to me. And then I realized that he wouldn't respond. Then all the smoke was into my face. So I sat back, took a deep breath, and realized that I had to go get him. It felt like there was no oxygen whatsoever. Breathing was not an option, basically. Amazingly, Josh located his brother in the smoke-filled room, but Corey was unconscious and barely breathing. We had to get out pretty quick because the flames were coming in his room. By this time, Margaret's neighbors and close friends, Robert and Maria Garcia, had arrived to help. Robert had found a ladder and positioned it against the house. I went up the ladder and took Corey from his arms and, you know, brought him down. As soon as I gave him to Robert, every part of my body was shaking. It was just the feeling that I've never felt before. Robert handed him to me and his face was completely black. It was kind of like gurgling, not really breathing. So I gave him a couple of breaths and patted him on the chest. He coughed and kind of woke up. I didn't know that he was burnt at all until the fire department turned the corner and somehow the glare of the fire truck hit him. And I could see his skin just hanging from his little legs and the back of his legs and it tore me apart. Hey, Josh, your mom is coming. I don't want her to seem like this, OK? I knew that she couldn't see Corey because she would just go ballistic. So I held her back. Riverside County firefighter Robert Snow was one of the first to arrive. Hi, buddy, before you heard it. Corey was on the lawn, and we started working on him right away, taking care of his burns and stuff. So we pretty much had to ignore the fire and take care of the medical type things. The fire had left Corey with third-degree burns over 50% of his body, and doctors gave him only a 50-50 chance to survive. But after a month in the hospital undergoing intensive treatment, he beat the odds and returned home. Once I found out that he was going to be all right, I was ecstatic. I was jumping up and down, hugging people at school. It, I was just happy that he was all right. Corey had survived an ordeal which would have meant certain death for this young boy if his brother hadn't performed a miracle. If Josh hadn't have got in there, Corey would have died. There was way too much smoke and heat for him to have been in there any longer than he was. He jumped out of that two-story window and just climbed right back up. Something was with him, a guardian angel with him. I was guided, I know I was. It had to have been my father. Josh, Josh. Joshua's father, Matthew, had died when he was just two years old. 
Had he returned from the grave 14 years later to watch over his son? Everybody has a guardian angel, and Matthew knew that he needed to wake Josh up, and Josh needed to save his brother. He jumped out of a two-story house, ran around, chimneyed up to another roof, punched in a window with his fist, not even get one cut on his wrist, jumping into a burning house, not getting even burned. The whole thing was a miracle. Today, Corey is well on his way to a full recovery. I think I'm coming along pretty good. I would still be in the hospital right now, but I'm running, I'm riding my bike, I'm swimming, just like I always used to. That is a major ordeal that not even some adults can live through. But Corey is strong-willed, and he pulled through, and that was what the miracle was. Joshua's dream was so intriguing that we wanted an expert's opinion about it. So we invited author and dream analyst Cynthia Richmond to join us once again. Hello there. Richard, it's great to see you again. How are you? I'm terrific, Cynthia. So you've just seen this incredible story. Do, do people often dream about departed relatives? They do often, and there's two different types of these dreams. There are dreams of departed loved ones that are the, a normal part of the grieving process. We think of them, we're still mourning, grieving, and we dream of them. But there are other dreams, such as this one, where the dream is so vivid and seems so real that the dreamer actually feels like they were visited by the spirit or soul of their departed loved one. And what do you think that means? Truthfully, I believe that in some cases this is actually what happens, that somehow the spirit is able to communicate through the dream state. It may be less scary, for example, for someone to um, make contact in that way than they would if someone, a soul or a spirit were able to walk in the room. Um, in this case, obviously, there were lives to be saved. It was an urgent situation. Uh, had this boy kept sleeping, who knows what would have happened, what kind of tragedy that we might be talking about. So in this case, I believe the spirit of the father actually did communicate with, uh, with young Josh. That's fascinating. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, I would just like to say to Josh, congratulations young man listening to your dream, taking it seriously, and then to take that action. You know, it's one thing to dream and remember your dream. It's another thing to understand it. Both very important. But the third and most important step for all of us is to then take the action. You empowered yourself to do it, and I think you're a real hero, and I'd like to thank you for that. And I'd like to thank you, Cynthia, for joining us again. It's great to see you, Richard. See you again. If you'd like to learn more about your dreams, look for Cynthia Richmond's new book, Dream Power. We'll be right back. Coming up, the bond between a boy and his dog is given its greatest test. We already had to love him because he was all over him. So they would do things like he had a toy Jeep and they'd ride the Jeep around and Grady would sit up there with him. They were best buddies. And then one day his best buddy went for a run in the field and disappeared. What happened next is a story of love, faith and miraculous survival. And next, a young television producer schedules an interview with a woman she's never met. When you're outside of a world, you have your images of what that world is like. Come on, guys. This Hello. is my crew. We sort of went in there with a bias, and she wasn't what I expected at all. What neither of these women expected was that their brief encounter would be the start of a miracle. When It's a Miracle continues. There's an old saying about unlikely couples in love. God makes them and they find each other. Well, sometimes finding each other is more difficult than you might imagine. In fact, it can be downright miraculous. Take our next story. It begins with a chance meeting and ends with a chance meeting. But it's how these two meetings are connected that will make you believe in miracles. In the fall of 1983, Sharon Harvey was a news producer for a Pittsburgh television station. Her latest assignment? A series of profiles on women of different religious backgrounds. So I had to find three different types of women who represented different faiths. Rosenberg. Okay, let's go. I heard that she was a dynamic speaker, that she was pretty, that she was just camera ready, and that she was a nice person. 
When Sharon met Froma for the first time, she was not disappointed. Hi, I'm Sharon. Sharon. I've been Sharon. waiting. Mm -hmm. How are you? When you're outside of a world, you have your images of what that world is like. Come on, guys. This is my crew. How do you do, Froma? We sort of went in there with a bias. Here's a woman who I thought, okay, she's going to be the subservient little whatever. Shabbat? Shabbat. 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 Oh, yeah. And she wasn't what I expected at all. She made me feel at home, and she was just so direct and very sensitive and a very endearing type of person. And how special you are. So this takes place on the Sabbath. Fruma felt an instant connection with the young producer as well. Sharon came into my house, zoomed in on just the right questions. Is there any spiritual growth from it week to week? She was very sensitive, very refined, very gentle. I liked her right away. Fruma spent the afternoon explaining to her guest the deep historical and spiritual roots of her Orthodox faith. She reenacted a Shabbos for us, which is Hebrew for the seventh day celebrations, the day of rest. I was trying to show her how everything at the Sabbath table, even though it was physical, had a spiritual value that went with it. The blessing on the wine, the, the covered breads, the, the idea of a family sitting together every week and having private time for the family, no telephone, no television, just your family and God. I'll see you guys back at the station, thank you. Sharon was so moved and impressed by Fruma Rosenberg that even after the camera crew had packed up and gone, she lingered behind. I stayed there for a good while and I, it was a big change for me. I just started meditating more and thinking more. And I found that I just had better relations watching me a little bit, and I'm watching him. His name was Avi, and he was relatively new in town. I definitely did notice that uh, she had lived in Pittsburgh. I said, oh, really? I lived in Pittsburgh, too. You grew up in Pittsburgh? Yeah. And I asked him, do you know from a Rosenberg, thinking that he would say that was a cousin, or that was a distant relative, or that was an aunt. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. She's my mother. That's your mother, Fruma? Oh, my God. He said, that's my mother, and I almost fell off my seat. It was just like such a small, small world. The next morning, Avi called his mother with the news. Hello? Hi, Mom. Oh, hi, honey. How are you? I'm doing very well. I have something to tell you. Do you remember Sharon Harvey? When Avi Sharon called and Harvey. said that he had She's met Sharon at a Sabbath table and that she was an Orthodox Jewess, I was astounded. I was amazed. I think that's wonderful, honey. I think I'm going to be seeing a lot more of her, Mom. I need your, your blessing on this. You have my blessing, honey. And I always knew that when Avi found Thank his you. mate, it was going to be somebody who was really spiritual and really exotic. And as soon as he said, Sharon Harvey, I thought to myself, this is it. Sixteen months later, in June of 1991, Avi Rosenberg and Sharon Harvey were married. It's so amazing how God choreographs the world that I could have this chance meeting with this beautiful woman, connect with her, feel a kindred spirit, a bond, and a thousand miles and years later find out that my son feels the same way about her. Equally amazing, it was from his connection with Sharon that sparked her conversion to Judaism, which set up the chance meeting with Avi. A miracle is something where the hand of God is obvious, and there were just too many different things that happen for it to be just coincidence. Miracles happen when we're ready for them. Did you happen to know? Those miracles are very humbling because you realize there's a force greater than yourself 
that participates in your life, that oversees your life. That's your mother, Fruma? It's a Jewish belief that not a blade of grass moves without God willing it to happen. That divine intervention is a part of everybody's life every single day. Sharon and Avi's amazing story came to us from our friends Yitta Halberstam and Judith Leventhal, authors of Small Miracles of Love and Friendship. You'll find many more intriguing stories in their book, and I urge you to check it out. We'll be right back. Coming up, the parents of a teenaged boy dying of heart and liver failure are told that there is little chance for his survival. I'm sorry, I'll talk to you soon. You love your children and their your entire life, and to be told that you need to say perhaps goodbye to them is very home together, okay? We knew at that point that it would take a miracle to save our son. And next, as the residents of a small town make an all-out effort to locate a missing dog, the pet's owner, a young boy, prays for a miracle. Don't let him be dead or hurt. Please get ready, be okay. He asked God if he couldn't bring him home to make sure that somebody was loving him and taking care of him. The answer to his prayer when It's a Miracle continues. And now once again, Richard Thomas. If you've ever owned a pet, you'll understand how devastating it can be to lose one. Flyers like this one tell the story. Desperately searching for lost dog, family pet, answers to the name Grady. But flyers can't tell the whole story. Was the animal found? Was there a happy ending? Well, our next story answers those questions in a miraculous way. When Zachary Gaff was three years old, his father, Tom, bought him a Scottish terrier he named Grady. And they hit it off. Grady had to love him because he was all over him. So they would do things like he had a toy Jeep, and they'd ride the Jeep around, and Grady would sit up there with him. They were best buddies. When he rode my toy Jeep, I'd just step on the gas and go as fast as I could, and his hair would be flying. As time passed, the bond between Zach and Grady continued to grow. I play with him all the time. I help feed him, and I give him some doggy bones if it is good. And then in March of 1997, Zach's mother, Carolyn, let Grady and their other dog, Rocky, out for a run in the yard. There was nothing unusual for them to be gone one, two, three hours. And we didn't worry about it because there was nothing out there they hadn't seen before. But that day, Rocky came back, and Grady wasn't with him. Come on, Rocky. Where's Grady, Rocky? Grady! Oh, we're very upset because he'd never left before. He always stayed right around us. Grady! 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 And we went looking for him right away, and we called around and drove up and down the road calling for him and looked everywhere. Grady. Come on, Grady! and he didn't come, and I felt really, really bad. He couldn't have been that far away, we didn't think, and he never came, and so we, we really started to panic then. Do is just hand these out. And the next morning, my wife started putting ads out, signs and everything, saying Grady's missing. We printed up flyers, we took them to all the local convenience stores, we put them in the post office. Within days, the entire town of Newton, Alabama, knew that Grady was missing, but no one had seen the dog. We had notices out to all the veterinarians in the area to look for him. We had poster boards out to be on the look for him. We put ads in the paper, lost, missing Scotty Terrier, please contact us. They were pretty much dead ends, everything was. It's just like he disappeared. Zach was very upset. He cried. He cried a lot. Every night, he wanted to know where he was at and if he was taken care of. He didn't want him to be dead. <laughs> being that young and being tenderhearted, too, he cried a lot and he prayed a lot. 
he needed Grady back, and he was just really tore up about it. Carolyn also prayed for a miracle, but there was no sign of their lost pet, and they began to fear the worst. The days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months. There just didn't seem to be any kind of hope. Well, after five, six months, we probably accepted that he was never going to be seen again. But even then, it wasn't anything unusual for Zachary to pray for him. Please let Grady be OK. He asked God if he couldn't bring him home, and if he couldn't have him, to make sure that somebody was loving him and taking care of him so he would have a good home. And don't let him be dead or hurt or anything like that. Amen. I broke my heart. And then, nearly two years after Grady had disappeared, Carolyn received a mysterious prophecy from a minister visiting from out of town. There's a thing in your life you've been praying for. It's been a long time coming. In four days, he's going to answer that prayer. He said, so be expecting it four days from now. He said, your children are going to be very excited. He said, this is a family thing. And four days later, as Carolyn's niece, Crystal Blocker, was leaving her boyfriend's home, the prophecy came true. Hey, wait a minute. Whose dog is that right there? My boyfriend and I said, that was like Grady. When I said Grady, he popped them ears up, and he turned around, and he looked at me weird. Hello? Hey. I called and I said, Carol, and I said, I don't want you to get your hopes up, but this dog looks like Grady. Can you keep him there? Woo! All right, that's that. Don't your hopes up. It may not be him. Woo! I said, y'all need to hurry up and get up here and check him out, see if it's him. And she said, well, I'll be right over there. She calls up. She thinks she found Grady. Then we just went flying down there. I mean, it seemed like I blinked my eyes, and she, here she comes from that van. Zach ran out and he said, Grady, is that you? And I was thinking, oh, please be that dog. I don't think he could have accepted it not being him. Grady, is that you, boy? Saw this little fur ball. He was matted and just looked hideous standing on the ground. Is that you, Grady? It looked like him in the face, but I really want for sure. She kept saying, Grady, and the more she said his name, the more he reacted to her, so. I think he kind of knew who they were, but he was a little bit, I don't know, maybe he was as shocked to see them as they were to see him. Hey, look what I've got. When we got him cleaned up and brought him home, he was like a new man, and he didn't miss a beat. I mean, he, he called him, here he comes. Grady, come here. And he remembered, seemed like he remembered everything, like he never lost any time at all. After nearly two years of continuous prayers and an unexpected message that Grady was about to return, he was home again safe and sound. It was four days since the revival that we had found Grady. So God answers prayers, and he was safe, and he was back home, his old self. I was really elated. We just were very excited, and I was very happy for Zachary, because for a lot of people, just a little dog may not be a lot, too, but that was his buddy, and he loved him. It really was a miracle. What happened to Grady during the time he was missing remains a mystery. But what's clear is that the Gaff family's prayers were answered. Grady continues to thrive, and he and Zach are once again the best of friends. We'll be right back. Coming up. A high school football team dedicates the first game of its season to a fellow student who is fighting for his life. And that they would fight hard to win it so that Robbie would fight hard to come home and be with them again. But no one realized just how miraculous the power of their love and prayers would be. When It's a Miracle returns. After doing hundreds of stories on this show, we've discovered that there are basically two kinds of angels, the heavenly ones and what we refer to as earth angels, ordinary people who inspire extraordinary events. Our next story contains both varieties, and together they work to perform an amazing miracle. In 1998, Robbie Mendonza was a senior varsity athlete in Salinas, California. And his parents, Robert and Nancy, enjoyed supporting their son during the school games. 
Nancy and I always attended Robbie's baseball games. It was uh, something that was near and dear to his heart, and we were part of his cheering crew. Baseball was something that Robbie started playing as a very young boy, playing t-ball, and became an all-star when he was 10 years old, and was very much looking forward to his senior year in high school, and they had developed him into a pitcher. But something was wrong with Robbie. He slowly began losing energy and having difficulty breathing. His mother became increasingly concerned as she watched her son's health deteriorate. Robbie wasn't sleeping well and he couldn't breathe, so he started preferring to sleep downstairs because he said the air was cooler and he would sleep with a fan blowing into his face. And he said that was the only way he could sleep and breathe. Robbie was diagnosed with a severe case of asthma. We were trying to accept what we were being told, but we were frightened because he was very ill. So my husband actually chose to sleep downstairs with him because we were afraid for him to be by himself. Hey, 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 Rob, you all right? He had a, a terrible night breathing. He told me that he did not feel very well at all and that uh, he thought that there was something seriously wrong with him. I need help. Okay. Okay. He was very scared because no one knew what was wrong. You're going to be okay. Slow down. Just... I knew that he was very ill at this particular point and was obviously a great concern to me and, and, and my wife. Robbie was rushed to the UC San Francisco Hospital, where Dr. Nathan Bass gave his parents a new and even more frightening diagnosis. I personally spoke with them in the intensive care where we had admitted Robbie and telling them, you know, the seriousness of the situation. Our tests indicate he has severe liver failure and he could conceivably not make it through the night. We are going to do more tests, but he may need a liver transplant. He was very seriously ill. I think when he arrived on our doorstep, he was three quarters dead. Mr. and Mrs. Mendonza. That evening, Robbie's other vital organs began to fail. By 11 p.m., Robbie's condition had grown so severe that once again, Dr. Bass met with his parents. I explained to them that he was in very severe heart failure, that his liver was really a secondary issue at that point that his heart would have to recover for his liver to do well and for him to survive. I'm sorry, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> you love your children and then your entire life, and to be told that you need to say perhaps goodbye to them is very difficult to do. We pray to our Heavenly Father to not take our son to give us the strength to help the doctors to know what to do so that they would be able to save his life. But Robbie's condition remained critical. I just want you to know, son, how much we love you. But he wasn't mentally able to comprehend what was being said. And so his father and I just held his hand and we told him that we loved him and how special he was and what a tremendous son. He had been. We're not leaving here until we can all go home together, okay? We knew at that point that it would take a miracle to save our son. In 1998, 17-year-old high school athlete Robbie Mendonza's health began to fail. At first, his parents were told that he'd developed a severe case of asthma, but soon it had progressed to the point where he had to be hospitalized. It was then that his doctors discovered that Robbie's vital organs, including his liver and heart, were shutting down. His parents, Nancy and Robert, began praying for a miracle. And the only person that could do that was our Heavenly Father, and so we turned our son over to him. That's all we could do. By the next morning, Robbie had regained consciousness, but his condition remained guarded. And then, something amazing happened. Robbie said, Mom, is there anyone else in the room with us? It's just us, honey. What about those people over there? You mean the nurses? No, 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 in the room. They've been here all morning. I can hardly hear them. 
And I can barely see them, but... Now they're there. They said, please have them come over here where I can talk to them. And I became actually more frightened at that time because I thought they're here to take my son. And at first, like it did with my wife, it scared me uh, because I thought that these heavenly messengers were there to take him. But then I realized that if that was the case, he'd have been gone already. They weren't there to take him. They were there to help him through this. Of course, I had no idea who they were, and, uh, but I, knew, I do know they were with him. With the arrival of Robbie's guardian angels, his spirits improved, but they weren't the only angels in his life. When the word got to the school that Robbie was in a situation where he was literally fighting for his life, his friends started making posters for Robbie. You got a lot of friends, buddy. And doing what they could to help him, for him to know of their prayers and their love for him. The Salinas High Cowboys decided as a team that they would dedicate the first football game of the season to Robbie and that they would fight hard to win it so that Robbie would fight hard to come home and be with them again. Our friend taped the game and the Cowboys won that game, one of the few they won that season in honor of Robbie. There was a wonderful videotape that they did of some of the kids and some of his friends in the stands. I know you're probably sitting there laid up. Just got a sign over there for you. Just hope you feel better. And see you soon, buddy. We miss love you, Robbie. You get better. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you. We get love out. you. I'll bring you a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're getting better. Please, you can do it, man. Pull through. Right, we miss you, Rob. Yeah, I miss you, Rob. Bye. Robbie watched that tape hours on end. It's something that's near and dear to his heart. The tape increased Robbie's resolve to get well, and five weeks later, he returned home. First time I came back from the hospital for two months, I was all weak and tired, and all these people that loved me were all here having this party for me. So they had balloons and banners all over, and they stayed just a few minutes just to welcome him home, but it was a sight and a feeling that I'll never, ever forget. Listen, thanks again for coming. We really appreciate it. I remember I went, sat on the couch, and just lay there for an hour. Usually when I was laying down, I could feel like my heart like almost like jumping out of my chest because it's beating so hard, so fast. And after that hour, I didn't feel my heart beat no more. I feel like my heart's already beating slower. I'm gonna stay home. I'm gonna stay home. That's pretty much when I knew everything was gonna be okay. Robbie's heart had slowed down to a more moderate pace, and little by little, he began to regain his strength. When he first got home, we used to walk one house down the block and then back, and then the second day it was two houses and then back, and then the third day it was three houses and back, and just to see that little improvement with him every day was just, just wonderful. In just three months, Robbie had walked himself right off the transplant list. This was a young man who had a lot going for him in terms of the support he had from his family. I think that having faith in one's ability to recover, having faith in whatever one believes in when one is under any tremendous stress is going to help an individual. Robbie Mendonza had literally been at death's door. Three months later, he was once again back at Salinas High, rooting for his former baseball teammates. I know a miracle happened. I know that our prayers were heard, and I know that our prayers are answered. I believe that the angels came to Robbie, and I believe that they communicated with Robbie and helped Robbie make his choice and gave him the strength to choose. I think the angels gave me a lot of strength but most of the strength, I think, came from my family and the prayers. The uh, support and faith that I got from all my friends and family was tremendous and was pretty much what got me through this whole thing. I want to thank everybody that ever was out there that prayed for me, that admitted a lot to me. And I want to thank Heavenly Father for helping me out. We'll be right back.
That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night.